that we have. So the meeting is being recorded. We're going to be sharing it on our Facebook page for you if anyone wants to go back to it. Uh, as you can see, our speaker is Sarah Abdullah. Sarah is a Lebanese social entre entrepreneur, technology enthusiast, women and youth rights activist. Sara graduated as a computer engineer from St. Joseph University in 2011. She joined Murex after graduation, one of the top fit, uh, fintech companies worldwide, where she worked as a technical consultant for six years on very important and high pro, uh, uh, value projects across the EMA and uh, APAC region. Simultaneously, she was a volunteer with more than six organizations working on women and youth empowerment. Sarah was elected as a Youth Advisor Council member at the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. She was also chosen to participate in Tech Women Exchange program where she spent her, mem uh, her mentorship period at LinkedIn, San Francisco, and worked on her social enterprise idea with top uh, executive there. She founded her social ent uh, enterprise named Libro, whose mission is to, uh, to turn youth challenges into opportunities. Sarah was selected as a WEF Global Shaper early in 2017. She was also assigned as co-leader for Facebook Developers Circle Beirut early 2018. The community has now 2,800 uh, plus develop, uh, developers for whom more than 350 events were organized. Also, this is shared on their page. From training and tech talks to local global hackathons. Sarah is a regional speaker. She got the opportunity to share her experience and insights at uh, more than 40 conferences across the MENA region. So, Sarah, I would like to welcome you. Thank you for your time. We hope we get a lot of ideas from you and to share your experience with us regarding our topic. I will let you introduce the topic and uh, everything. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to have like the session today. Thank you for the organizers. They have been doing amazing efforts since months now to make sure that all those webinars are well organized. So I just want to thank you as well for all what you're doing for the community. Uh, so the purpose, uh, first we're talking in English as well, since we have many participants who are not like, uh, who do not speak Arabic. So to make sure like uh, we are all able to understand uh, what we are sharing today. Uh, so the topic today is mainly about the future of jobs and entrepreneurship post COVID-19. Um, mainly what we're seeing now and post COVID-19 is what we expected to see anyway after like three or four years because everything is going towards technology, everything is booming, uh, but COVID-19 has accelerated everything and therefore we have no more challenges to be able to proactively work on ourselves to cope with those changes. So let me start by sharing my screen. So what we're going to discuss today is more related to the global scale, but like all of them apply here in, in, in our country, if it's in Lebanon or even in the MENA region. Uh, so uh, first we're going to start by discussing what is the direct impact of COVID-19 uh, on jobs and on, uh, on uh, companies. We need uh, to see like uh, what are the current challenges and how can we turn them to opportunities because once we have a lot of challenges, then we have the room of a lot of opportunities as well. Uh, definitely this, we're going to check all the reports and statistics because we should always rely on data and on stats whenever we take a stand from a certain like topic and we decide on what is the action plan that could actually cover those challenges. And finally, which is the most important, is a message of hope. Unfortunately, we are uh, being surrounded most of our time by negativity, negative thoughts, perhaps negative perception. Uh, uh, being fed up of the challenges instead of investing this energy and focusing about how we can turn it to opportunity to benefit ourselves, but also benefit our society. this since Eddie did like amazing job in the, in the introduction uh, as shared on the messages so please all if you have like any questions throughout the presentation uh, please go to slido.com and enter 19273 uh, as a meeting uh, number so you can draft all your questions 
so other like your colleagues as well could uh, could like uh, uh, just if you want to uh, upvote as well for the same question so we could cover the most like common questions between all participants so what is the status today why this topic is now becoming very urgent and we need to tackle it like with this high importance uh, around the just in q1 2020 almost we have lost more than 130 million jobs and we are at risk because uh, many of the people like the global workforce work on hourly basis and if they work then they're going to get the shelter they're going to get food but if they don't work then they are in a very bad situation so we are at a huge risk today to have almost 1.6 billion workers in the workforce losing their jobs and have their livelihood destroyed uh, so therefore we need all to collaborate together to try to work on the solution since it's affecting not only like our country or ourselves or our economy, but it has an impact on the global scale. Now to start, I have a question for you. Um, I have a question for you, which is the following. Let me know, are you today hopeful about your future? I want you to think about yourself and tell me to go on Slido and to answer this question. Are you hopeful about your future, your career, or are you scared and you don't know what to do next? So are you happy? Or are you sad and looking for support? Let's see your answer. So we have many participants here. I'm not gonna move forward before I see like more answers coming through. As you see, like, uh, I think we have good, like generally when I ask this question, I have more negativity in the room. So I'm happy that it's 50-50. Okay, happy anymore, it's 53. Um, actually, this is the main question because we need to know if we're not hopeful, if we're not motivated, then we won't be able to develop ourselves and to focus on what matters and to focus on really improving ourselves and our skills moving forward. So our state of mind is the beginning. It's the first, Thing we should focus on before we think about skills, before we think about uh, jobs as well. So our state of mind is top priority. Make sure you are always taking care of it and of your mental health because it's the main key for us to move forward. And this is something like I try to manage on daily basis uh, to be able like to continue with the same momentum on every day. So I'm just gonna stop it for now. Happy to end it with the. Uh, you see, I'm going to cover your question uh, later. I'm going to look into what are the main challenges. Like those challenges, some of them were already present before COVID-19. And we have like now, uh, most of them are becoming like more critical or more urgent with all like the problems we had after COVID-19. So the first challenge faced by professionals, and here I'm talking from the fresh grad or even the students level, so the actually the senior level. First, we have a huge gap between what we are taught in the university and what we have in the market. And here, it's not only a local problem, it's a global problem. In the era of fourth industrial revolution, everything is going quickly. We are going very fast and we have a certain process to follow to include a lot of stuff in the curriculum because I teach at university as well and I know this process and I understand it. And therefore, relying fully on university and on one degree to actually find ourselves in the market uh, is not the right decision to do. So we need the proper orientation and we need to understand this gap and to understand how we can actually fill this gap. I'm not removing the responsibility on the universities here. Definitely, there's a lot of work to be done on the curriculum level, but I cannot like just blame the university and do nothing from my side. We need always to see how we can help ourselves if we didn't get the needed help from our surroundings. Second point, which is the most important point, which is lack of self-development. Here, I'm not generalizing. I know many of you, and since you are already today here in the webinar, so you specifically are definitely working on yourself uh, to, to, like, to work on your skills. But if we look at generally how it's being done in our, like, in our society, you people are working on self-development. When I say here self-development, especially in the Middle East, 
and patience and self-development. Like for example, when I do, I do volunteer work, like I work in communities, like the community, like Facebook, the circuit community. So I invest as volunteer my time for years for free. This is something we don't find every day. But let me tell you what we gain out of this time, for example, of community. First, we learn how to organize huge events. Today, the guys who like work and the ladies who are today on this webinar learned a lot on how to outreach thousands of people, how to organize, how to get speakers. So this is definitely good on the good skills we learn when doing community work. We get a lot of PR. If we want to get a good a good job or good opportunity in the organization, then we need PR, and PR here is different than Insta. Also, if the people who don't deserve, but they know someone, they would like put them in, in one place in the organization. But referrals are really strong talent in which like everyone would feel proud to have them like inside the company. So it's a way to get the PR. Self-development is by enrolling into like additional courses or even going into internships or working on projects for free just to build some technical skills. So if you want to look into this, um, we see that the amount of investment in self-development is still extremely low compared to the norm of the successful people uh, worldwide. So this is like just an area of reflection as well in case you know, like you, you're not investing until now uh, enough in the self-development part. Lack of orientation, and this is exactly what we're doing today because Devices, where the market is going, what we are doing today, all the stats I'm going to show you are from the word economic firm. It's a subjective opinion. It's never like what or what our family thinks, perhaps, or even what our universities uh, think about what is the future of job. We need to rely on data, uh, and there's a lot of trustworthy sources to get those data to know where could be our path moving forward. Because we need to choose the career path that's going to satisfy our passion towards a certain topic, but as well has a lot of opportunities in the market. So we need to find this combination. So unfortunately, until now, we have lack of this orientation and such events could be like one of the ways to, uh, to actually uh, provide this kind of info. Like we have the fourth challenges, uh, which is definitely none of us today, could be really lack of the basic like for example, I don't have access even to education. I'm not talking only about university, but about school. Some people don't have access. They don't have even the capabilities to have any like a digital device, like even like an iPad or laptop or any even if uh, So this is complete that I don't think together like now we can try to fix this, but we need to acknowledge that this is a problem that's forbidding a lot of really clever people to actually get the opportunities they deserve. Number five, which is lack of investment in companies, because here I'm a professional. I have two paths, or I'm going to be an employee, or I'm going to be an entrepreneur at a certain point, if you want just to split them into two categories. So if I'm going to be an employee and I'm working in a company that's not investing in the digital transformation and trying as a company actually to focus then all the company is at risk, and this is putting me at risk of losing my job now. So even if you are employees now, and you are afraid on your position in the company because your company is at risk due to this financial crisis, innovate. Try to suggest like ways or projects that could help the company, but all have to go inside the same company. So we, we, we need the employee to be entrepreneur, not only entrepreneur, which means we need to innovate. We need to take a small scale out of the company and try to even make it bigger the right culture in the company, but also the right attitude from the employees. Second point is the lack of investment. Like now we don't like worldwide, which means most of the companies and the employees need to learn how to survive with what they have in terms of resources, instead of only spending energy on trying to get funds. Because now funds are shrinking, so innovation is the main key that would let them, like all of them survive. So we've seen what are the main challenges for professionals. Now, if you want to focus more on entrepreneur, because there's a huge burden on entrepreneur as even to sustain all the payment they have on monthly basis, uh, especially with the credit crisis. So one important challenge faced by companies and entrepreneurs today is the lack of talent. 
And here I'm going to give you like one example because I work a lot with software developers and the people with like IT background and technology background. And a lot of juniors, but once we need senior talent, it's very hard to find the needed quality for senior talent. People who try to deliver to people who test their deliverable before actually delivering, people who are open for feedback. So we are and here not only I'm talking like local, but this is an international level. And we're gonna see in the next steps what are the most needed jobs. Uh, we need to work on our talents, we need to upskill our workforce to be able to cope with the new market needs. Second, many of the companies don't know what's digital transformation. Even now, if they want to go like digital and they want to automate more of their work, they don't know how to do it. So this I think what's happening now with Corona is a good test and a good example for companies and a good opportunity for them to see how to hedge and how to optimize their procedure, their processes, even their services, for example, in order to adapt to this new digital era. Who can survive even in a global pandemic like the one we have for COVID-19? So is um, the problem of product management. When I say here product management, I don't just open one company and, respond and then I stop. We had, for example, Uber, but then we had Kareem, which is a copy of the same like ideas. But why Kareem went as well globally and to reach a point where they got acquired by Uber? It's because they innovated, because they understood the market, they started and the market, and they optimized their product to match the market. So we need more innovative product managers to help companies into actually taking this service of this product of the company to the next level. And until now, product managers, and that's why the top companies worldwide, for example, like Facebook now is investing heavily in people to reach product management positions since they have opening for product management. The fourth challenge for entrepreneur is the decrease in investment which is like we already discussed and the fifth and the last point like those are the top like five uh, main points the fifth point is related to the industry because now if we're gonna say like COVID-19 gonna stay until 2020 that some industry is gonna be directly affected and we're gonna see it in the next month so how do we work on like those are a lot of challenges to work on but let me tell you it's not we need we need to work on people because people are the main drivers of everything. We need definitely to invest more in technology and to upskill to understand and to deal with technology. If we deal with technology, then this is definitely going to push the whole ecosystem forward and it will affect positively the economy because we're going to have a lot of people working, we're going to have controlling in the countries, so it's going to boost the whole economy forward. Here I'm going to you like one example uh, of an initiative we launched uh, here in Lebanon. Uh, we started this initiative two weeks ago. And as you know, like Lebanon is not only suffering from COVID-19, we are in like in the top financial like uh, uh, crisis ever. So it's a nation of crisis. But instead, again, of saying uh, situation, a group of people we decided together to launch an initiative which is creating a consortium of the people in the IT industry, uh, entrepreneurs, and even like the serial uh, Lebanese entrepreneurs who are outside Lebanon who would like to invest uh, in their country. And we started one initiative to provide hope. So it's, to, it's hope for Lebanon, to provide more hope to Lebanon. It works on reskilling, upskilling of the whole workforce. Part of it is train the trainers, which are even the university students, uh, university sorry, professors. To actually try to help them in the new approach way of providing as well the curriculum, focusing on remote work, and this will definitely improve this year because what I see jobs, especially for people like now with the new age, it's not all the capital, like for example in Beirut or what I see in other cities. We don't have anymore with internet to what jobs I can have. And Corona has opened a huge opportunity here because all the companies have understood that I don't need people to be physically present to be productive in the company. So we need to leverage this a lot more to find the opportunity that suits us the best. Third, which is to 
support and planning to work between ecosystems. And here, the first project is going to be uh, working with the Sweden ecosystem because they've worked a lot, they have a lot of experience. So, why not benefiting from this experience and try to implement here in Lebanon? So, this is already a project we're working on. Um, the fourth point, which is here, and this is like it's needed more a close collaboration as well with the decision maker, which is creating more incentives for those companies to thrive in the private sector hands, but that doesn't mean we cannot push for what's better for us and for our societies. So that was a like a very high level. I'm gonna this is an actual statistic. Here, all the uh, information I'm gonna share with you are based on the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs of 2018, and their latest report issued in May 2020 about how the market was affected post COVID-19. So first, let's tackle the fear of machines. So in 2018, the humans were covering 71% out of the jobs. 29% were covered by machines. The perception was that in 2022, it's going to be 58 to 42%, but with COVID-19, this, and I see that in 2025, we are expected to have the machine covering from the current jobs, uh, 52%. Does that mean we need to be afraid? Does that mean we need to reflect that the machine is now taking over, taking over the job, everything is becoming automated, and we're going to reach a point where most of the population is becoming unemployed? Because we might be losing 75 million jobs, but we're getting 133 million jobs Skill set. The type of jobs are now completely different. So, yes, I'm going to lose uh, the kind of operational work in which, for example, I go and I do data entry on a daily basis. This is becoming operational and this is going to be slow from like normal human being doing it. Definitely the computer is going to be like much quicker in this. But who's going to feed this software? Who's going to create the software? Who's the, who are the expertise that's going to feed those software to do actually their task properly? This is the kind of skills and this is the kind of jobs we are needing in the next period. So I just want to tell you, we shouldn't be afraid that the machine is taking over if we work on our self-development. If we're going to stay and wait for everything to happen, we might be at risk to be unemployed in the next few years if it's not now. But if we work on our skill set, then definitely we're going to have our place in the market. It's all in our hands. If I'm going to look at those stats were like before COVID-19, uh, so mentioning that 54% of the global workforce worldwide will need upskilling. So we're saying half of the global workforce needs to work on their skill set, otherwise they will be at risk of losing their work. And here, here if we want to see in this diagram, some of the workers would need, like, for example, one month, one full month of upskilling. Some of them will need between one to three months. But let me ask you one question. Do you believe any company could actually invest, for example, more than three months to upskill the training for their training? Uh, and they're not having, like, they're not doing any job or having any return on investment in parallel? No. And this unemployment rate arising if people don't be proactive and work on their skill set instead of waiting for everyone to push them forward and to train them and to help them. It should be a self-initiative uh, taken at a certain point. Now, what are, what are the industries being directly affected by COVID-19? And here I'm taking this from the U.S. example. So everything related to food and beverage with the lockdown and most of the restaurants are closed. Really being affected. Everything related to clothing and retail, although people could order online, doing like shopping while being is not that high. Um, and then we have even like about the old way of, of doing like of having being educated because ed tech and online learning is booming. But the old fashioned way of providing education is going down. It's going down. the opportunities. So we've been talking about what we're losing, but now it's the time we look 
on what are the jobs and which we're going to focus moving forward. I try to done by industries, which industries will be boom and for skills and especially for technical ones, uh, since we're focusing on, on like uh, and so I took it as well. Now. Industries are booming. So we have the healthcare, everything related to healthcare and sector. Because we realize that we need our healthcare system to be strong enough in such kind of pandemic in the future more efficiently. Instead of perhaps having a lockdown for months, we need to invest more in R and D and a lot of different stuff related to the healthcare sector. I can put this presentation, like I can send it to the organizers to share it with you because we're not going to go into every single detail and everyone in the slides uh, for your own reference later on. But the industry that will be booming as well, related directly having a relation with the climate change, are everything related to agriculture, clean energy, and definitely agri tech and clean tech. So, how to like everything related to waste management? Everything related to sustainability, everything related to ecosystem. Um, so definitely those as well part of the industry that's going to be booming. And definitely in parallel, for example, for the technical background, people who would like to work more in IoT, then this is the way to be there. This is where they can invest uh, like their, their expertise and their skills because it's more hardware as well. Agritech and cleantech include more hardware, not only on the software part. So it would be a nice opportunity. Related to HR tech and ad tech, uh, like now the companies spend a huge amount of money to find the right talent. Can you imagine of people applying to the biggest companies? And then you have how much people can you hire so they can like do all the screening for all the people applying and then investing hours and hours in interviews. So everyone are trying to optimize now the recruiting process and therefore the referral I told you about previously could help. Because if I have a senior senior person in a company saying this is a really a trusted uh, like resource, I would advise you. Then they would have a competitive edge much higher than only applying throughout like the default uh, default place of the companies. So everything re related as well to the digital education, uh, everything related to like creating an ecosystem of learning. Uh, this is as well as as well. So those are the industries. Everything, all the industries, from HR to education to healthcare to everything related to climate change. So, but tech is always a layer on top of those industries to make everything automated and working efficiently. So, what are now the top technical and people skills that's going to be needed? I try to focus here for the sake of the time on the technical and people skills needed. First, everything related to data, gathering data and to artificial intelligence because i'm gathering all those data but then i need to analyze the data to know how to move forward how i'm going to leverage all this data to define perhaps a solution for the problems that are arising to know what i'm doing well and perhaps what i could do better so all this domain of data science will be is booming a lot and you would need all those emerging jobs of people to be able to fulfill uh, like those positions Everything related to cloud computing, engineering, software development, DevOps, uh, those will be really like very much needed. Uh, and here, like everything related to software development from back end to, to the front end to integration developers, to, to as well, uh, we have said everything related to cloud, everything related as well to, to matching and mapping between artificial intelligence and my software how i'm aggregating the data and mixing them with whatever the product i can have so this is like very much needed as well moving forward we have talked as well product development if it's an hr tech or agri tech or clean tech by the end of the day i'm working on a product so how to make my product better how to deliver it in the best way possible how to do my understand what I'm doing well, what I'm doing wrong, how to lead, what a team I should have around me, how to be a good lead, because you can innovate on their own. No one is enough to have the needed level of innovation. So how to make my whole team innovate and have the right culture as well in my team. So all of this falls under product development that are really needed moving forward.
generally it's very easy, like it's easier when, when discussing this with technical people to convince them about the technical skills needed. But discussing people skills, this is where it becomes like more problematic because we have the attitude, again, I'm not generalizing. We have the attitude to believe that we know how to handle everything. We know how to handle complex. We know how to lead. We know how to handle like everyone and how to deal with everyone. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. And people skills is among the most, it's even more important nowadays than technical skills, because no one can do anything on their own anymore. So I need to be part of the team. I need to know how to be a team player. I need to know how to be a mentor, how to be a leader for the people I'm working with. So this is everywhere. To the Middle East and North Africa, we're going to say that 98, 90, sorry, um, uh, I forgot. 93% out of the whole like company needs to have people with soft skills to actually work in their company. So it's becoming needed and we need to work on this. And soft skills are not just by watching a webinar or by like uh, taking on how to be a good leader. It's good to understand, for example, the theoretical aspect, but we need to practice. People skills, it's about practicing. I need to know if I'm dealing with those people. Am I getting them frustrated? Or they are like feeling relief, they are giving instead of being intimidated. So this is not easy. And we can never reach the point to say we are the great communicator ever. Every day we learn something else. Every day we become at one milestone and we learn how to handle a different milestone. Uh, handling our peers, like knowing how to communicate with our peers is different than how to communicate, for example, with our managers, different than how to communicate with C-level people, different how to communicate with my team members, how to make them motivated, especially in those hard times, for example, how to, be, to keep everyone around me motivated to keep pushing and keep like giving the energy. So people skills need practice. And here are the top needed human skills or people skills in companies. First, creativity. How to be creative? Like definitely if I go to my manager and tell them I have a problem and then I'm silent again, like we do most of the time. We acknowledge the problem, but how many of the people try to have a creative solution? And creativity is generally the one that doesn't cost the huge amount of money. Because definitely if we have billions of dollars, we can find a solution for everything. Creativity is finding smart solutions, not only costly solutions. So creativity is very needed. Persuasion. Now I have, like, let me give you an example. Uh, the guy who worked on the stories on Facebook, he was 18 years old. He got hired at Facebook without a degree because he has developed a game application that went really viral uh, globally. So when he joined Facebook, he's 18, so he's still very young. We're becoming old, like now we're in our like, mid 30s, we're becoming older. He was very young and he told them that he used to enjoy Snapchat a lot because of the story. So he wanted to create a case study of implementing this actually inside Facebook. So after reaching for the management and persuading one manager after one manager, they decided to give him a small team to test. They piloted the stories on a few amount of clients. And after it was a success, it was implemented now you see on Insta, on Facebook and everywhere. So it's a small initiative with needed perseverance and the needed persuasion, like he was able to reach very high like uh, levels inside Facebook. Time management is very important. I hear a lot of the points like I don't have time. I, I work at nine till midnight every day, but I say I like I don't have time now because I have 40% of my time dedicated for volunteering and completely community work. I have all the rest being dedicated to my daily BAU of work that I do. Uh, so we need to know how to manage our time in order to be able to like give more and to be able to be more productive. Am I telling you here, stop doing anything in your life and only focus on your career and your self-development? Never. Because as we said in the beginning, our mental health is important. Being uh, happy is important. But we need to allocate time for everything. Like we need to allocate, I have on my calendar the time in which I'm going to see my parents. That I have the time in which I'm gonna spend like a one-on-one -on -one or going on date with my husband. So it's important 
to make sure we are doing this time management to be able to have a balance in our life. Otherwise, it's going to become a chaos and definitely we're going to be losing like one side for another. Knowing how to collaborate as well is very important as people skills. And this is what we already discussed. And the fifth and important point is adaptability. Like now after COVID-19, many people, why some people lost their job and some people not? Because some people were, we cannot do anything. COVID-19 is letting us be not productive. We cannot find solution. Those people have lost their jobs much quicker than the people who actually try to find work around. Let's go, for example, use this tool or let's try to use this tool. That's not to say I don't know how to go digital. Let's try to find work around. So adaptability to crisis, which is almost every day in the working environment, is important. And we need to be leading in this. We need to be leading in this adaptation, not waiting for everyone else aside us to lead. We need to be leaders. And this is not a culture we always are encouraged to do since we are born. Born to, to be followers in our schools, in our universities, in our society. And we need to learn how to be leaders. And if we are in a very toxic environment, I always say it's fine. We cannot like force everyone to have the best culture everywhere. But you have the choice to go into a place where it gives you the culture that's going to give you the space to innovate and to be happy and be productive. So all of this is really nice. So if you we need now to say how to practice all those human skills, what to do? First is to listen and to receive constructive feedback. Uh, like for example, I always seek feedback. I'm not always satisfied from the outcome. Like we all we all like to receive like the best feedback ever each time, but it's not always the case. But we should be a good listener. We should be a like good listener, which means when someone is telling me something, I'm not thinking about my answer and I'm not trying to be defensive. And I'm not thinking just how, how I'm gonna like prove them wrong. I need to listen to the people because even if they are mistaken, perhaps I'm not mistaken in the content, but it's only my approach of communication that needs to be amended to like, make it clearer. What I'm saying is to be clearer. So we need to receive feedback, but you need to ask the right people for feedback. And here I encourage everyone to have mentors. I have mentors myself uh, in different industry, perhaps in an industry, perhaps mentors to help me in my career. So at each stage, we're going to have one mentor that is more senior than us, who's going to help us along the road. And they're going to be providing us with constructive feedback. So let's take this positively. Second, community work. As I told you before, being a volunteer and being an active community member helps us a lot and it becomes addictive. Like for me, it's really when I left Firax, uh, it's because at a certain point, um, like I got burned out because I was working until 3 a.m. at the company. And at the same time, I, I couldn't stop like all my volunteering work because seeing the impact on young women and, and youth. Uh, and finding jobs, finding opportunities, which could turn some people's lives was like, very addictive for me. And that's why I decided at a certain time to stop what I was doing at Linux, the company I learned a lot from, and decided to jump into having actually a dedicated company to cover those and to be able to keep people uh, with it. And let me tell you a secret here, like uh, this year, I was one of the startups who got affected by this financial crisis, and I had to freeze my company and now I'm working remotely as a product owner with UAE. And here I need to acknowledge that even myself, I did something wrong. I focused so much on services. I didn't predict to have something like COVID-19 coming who could like stop us and make it like even harder. I didn't expect to have the financial uh, crisis in Lebanon and having all the banks stop working as well. Uh, so I'm not just going to blame about what's happening. Definitely, if I'm going to do my next startup or I'm going to think about like a next startup, definitely I'm going to think about this tool to make it more resilient so we can like fight or, or like be able to, to handle any crisis that we can have along the way. The point is our personal relationship. And this is sometimes we ignore. Like if I'm fighting all the time with my parents, with my friends, with my partners, then definitely. I have some area in my communication to be worked on and to be like amended. So it's good to assess, to step back and do our self assessment and see if we are already in a good shape with the main people around us, the people who interact on a daily basis with them, then we're doing good. If I'm having a lot of issues with all of them, 
then they could be a good practice for us to optimize our relationship for them and optimize our communication strategy. So now we have said like just a summary where we are now in the presentation. So we have covered which industry is going to be booming, what are the technical skills needed, what are the people skills needed, and how to work on each one of those. So now I have all those skills, but if I am unable to do the right professional branding, to be able to, to show uh, the companies, perhaps, or the recruiters, or even the investors that I'm an entrepreneur, those skills and those abilities, then perhaps I'm not going to get my best opportunity. So I need you all to think about your professional branding. And here, when we talk about professional branding, it's not only CV, but it's our presence as well on social media, which is becoming key. What are we posting on Facebook? What are we posting on LinkedIn? How this will affect us? And here I get this question a lot because I'm a very vocal person on social media. I have all my posts public. Does this hurt you in your work? Because sometimes I might have some political statements as well. If everything hurts us if we communicate it wrong. But if we rely on data, not on emotions, if we rely on data, if we rely on facts, and then we express our opinion in the best way possible, then this is something positive. We cannot run away and avoid having our voice loud just so we are afraid to be like taken negatively. We should learn how to communicate and how to voice ourselves instead of being silent. But it's like I learned a lot along the way. Many have at a certain point, for example, at the beginning six years ago, before I started like in content creation, feeling I might be offensive in some form. So I learned this time, I took the feedback. And this is when I was saying take the feedback constructively because we need to listen to the people and we need to monitor the growth like my professional branding, is it growing with time? Is it getting better? What are the feedback generally I got? Are they more negative or are they more positive? On LinkedIn, especially if you have LinkedIn Premium, then you see all the analytics. So you're going to see how many people are checking the profile, what are the backgrounds, because I might be posting or contribute to the platform on LinkedIn, but actually I'm attracting the wrong profiles I'm seeking. So as well, even the professional branding is science. I need to see the data, to analyze the data, to know how to work better on my branding, to get better opportunities in return. And here I'm talking about mainly the Am I good on time, Eddie? Yes, you still, yes, have, you still have 13 minutes before okay. the question. Okay, great. So we've talked about as a rising opportunity. So if we're going to look at some statistics, here is the reference of remote work. We have already 18% of executives who work, who doesn't work on site because they've been traveling from one place to another. And here we're going to see that a lot of like business trips going to be reduced a lot after COVID-19 because most of them were like useless. Uh, so now they will really go just perhaps for confidential meetings, but not for any meeting. I think WebEx or Zoom could actually be a good solution for those. We're going to see that um, the people who are working are actually like paying less because they're not commuting on the road. They're not paying for food perhaps on an everyday basis, so they're paying less. Even for the companies, if they focus a lot on remote work, now Twitter have told like they're their employees, you can work forever at home if you want. Facebook gonna have remote work for like their employees until end of 2020 at home, and then it's up to them to decide what they want to do. So if really the company is focused on remote work, they're gonna save a lot of their operational costs and of big places, even everything related to the logistics payment inside a company from internet to electricity to all of that. So moving forward, remote work is gonna move. And this is a great opportunity for like the people who are not working in an ecosystem, perhaps full of opportunities, because I can work from here till abroad and I can get paid and then bring even more money to feed uh, the economy and the ecosystem I have here. Again, I'm going to share those data as well with you for reference later on. And then like we've talked about professionals, how to handle this moving forward, but also we need to talk about how companies should be more resilient something I told you, I, I didn't do it well. I don't like to call something a failure. I call it always areas of improvement. It's not cliche. I really believe that everything is a learning curve. So how the companies gonna have a resilient strategy? First, 
They need to give more motivation for their employees. They need to be authentic with their employees and fair. So for example, instead of letting 20 people go, if everyone are like having the right, again, if everyone are productive, instead of losing 20 people to go out of 40, perhaps I would ask everyone to stay like uh, work for half day. This culture of being fair is important. The culture of being authentic with my employees to tell them this is the risk we have. This is what we try to do to avoid like having to impacting you directly. But anyway, the impact would reach the employees at a certain point. So here is the plan we have in mind. And it will be great if they could provide the employees perhaps with one week of thinking to come and pitch an ultimate solution that could help the company better than to actually lay off some employees. So making and sustaining the employees' motivation is key for the companies to survive because they are the driver of like the company moving forward. Upskilling the workforce. And here we're gonna tell me the companies are already broke, how they're gonna invest in training their workforce, especially due, due to COVID-19, huge amount of free courses online from very reputable if it's universities or even education, providing free training. Now, as part of Facebook Developer Circle, we have dispatched 500 scholarship for product management, full three months, fully funded by Facebook UK, for example, to, to be certified as product manager. And many companies here in Lebanon have already like, sent their employees to do this. So the company have an alternative, but they need to think, and it needs the will. It's always about the will for the people who wants to find alternative to actually sustain the people they have. The company should think as well of hiring remote workers. Like for the companies who don't know how to do, for example, digital transformation. I don't need to hire a full timer. I can hire a freelancer for a certain period of time to put to help me implement it, perhaps train two employees in my company that would help me continue instead of closing the company. So this is a slight investment that the company should be ready to do if they don't want to like to lose perhaps sometimes like 10 years or even 20 years of being part of the market. Digital transformation is always a key pillar and it's not only due to COVID. Digital transformation was on this since years now, and now it's becoming more crucial than ever. So digital transformation is extremely important. If we have the digital aspect, the right culture, and the right talent in the company, definitely they're going to find a way to reach their goal, which is at least for the time being surviving the crisis. We're not going to be optimistic. I'm not going to say, uh, say here, if we have a goal, they're going to have millions of dollars. Entrepreneurship is, is much like than, than, than sometimes what we think. I'm not saying it's impossible or it's like we can never do it, but I'm saying because I hear a lot of people who want to be entrepreneur. Why do you want to be entrepreneur? Because I want to be my own boss and they want to get a lot of money. It's never like this. No one is giving money for free. Everyone needs a certain quality of service or product to give you their money. So at least for the time being, if we work on those like four majors, which is motivation, upskilling, remote workers, and digital transformation, we can definitely survive the current period. And here, it's not a dream. It just needs planning. It needs planning with a state of mind that we want to find the solution and we're going to be part of the solution. If the companies follow all those criteria, then definitely they should be uh, on the best side out of this. One, unfortunately, as, since Eddie as well introduced me as a woman activist, um, we have a list here of more gender gap because if we're going to look at what are the increasing roles and increasing like emerging jobs in the next few years, we're going to see that, for example, look at cloud computing. In the market, here we're talking about the global workforce, only 12% are women, where 88% are male. So it's because like here, it's not related to gender equality, if you want as a cultural point, but even here as a skill set point. So if we want to maintain a more inclusive and diverse environment inside the companies, and this is generally what the big companies look for, like Facebook, like Accenture, like all the big companies now have diversity and inclusion as one main pillar as part of their culture, then we have a big amount of work as well on reskilling and empowering women to go more into the tech field and especially in those parts of like emerging jobs. I'm 
any other, uh, like I have a message of hope to finish my presentation, uh, but I'm asking to get your question. So if you want Adi, we can start by taking your question. So if we miss like adding anything already in the presentation, we can cover it now in the question. And hopefully I'll be able to answer like everything. Yeah, so uh, if anyone has a question, you can add it on Slido or just ask it in the chat box in WebEx. We already have some questions uh, on the screen shared now, if you would like to start sharing them. Some of the questions are a big for Slido to, to have, so we'll, I'll be asking you after these questions, all of them. So if you want to start, uh you want me to ask you the questions or you would like to directly answer them as they are shared uh, on the screen the the slider one how, how how do you how do you feel more relaxed so we by some slide the question then we can jump to you uh, perfect perfect as much questions as, as we can yeah. and guys please feel free to ask Should companies start considering rebuilding their structure from its base uh, or wait after COVID-19? Why do why like time is not on our behalf because I'm waiting for time. The companies in this time are paying rent, are paying employees salaries, so they have a huge cost. So instead of investing and reskilling perhaps their employees while they're at home or something else, it's never a good idea to wait. Time is never now. Uh, like something from our benefit. We don't have time, we have a lot to do, and we have only 24 hours per day. We have two hands and 24 hours per day. So we have limited resources, so definitely no need to, to wait. We need to plan. And here is another point as well. We, we cannot jump directly into execution. We need to plan, but as well, don't spend huge amount of plans because like at least in Lebanon, we know we spend a huge amount of time planning and never jump into execution. So we need this balance between planning it well, but then go to the execution and start doing uh, what we believe because we're gonna learn. It's not always that we're gonna find uh, the right solution from like the first trial. We might fail from the first trial and try again. So the soonest we start, uh, the soonest we know what's the best solution for us. Do you think the universities in Lebanon have outdated curriculum? Uh, yes, a very clear uh, question. Uh, I think one good aspect, especially for technical background, is the ABET accreditation. Most of the universities who get the ABET accreditation have worked more on their curriculums, but definitely we are lacking orientation. Like, I need people with more practical experience. I do not need only material I can find online with like you I need more people who could help me in practical experience. I need more projects. Because if I am a software developer or computer science, I need to add, for example, my GitHub account on my CV. This is what matters more than like three, four common courses across uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are graduating. So this is what the university should invest in. So the university administration should know what is the market need and try to adapt their curriculum. And here, I'm not talking about one specific, like really university, I'm talking and we can always balance between getting profit from the university and at the same time increase the quality of education. So because the quality of education, if we increase it, it's going to increase the profit as well from the other hand. So we need to work on this and we need to listen to the people who know more about the market to be able to amend as well the curriculums. And this is part of what we were telling you, part of our project here in Lebanon is to work with the university administration. And by the way, they were really open. They were looking for people because we are offering our help for as volunteer as well, not, not as paid service. So as volunteers, they were looking forward to hear from us to see how to optimize their curriculum. So hopefully we could reach a certain place in this. I'm a French computer engineer. All companies need two plus years of experience. Uh, yes, let me tell you why they need two plus years of experience. If on your CV, you're gonna have a GitHub account in which you have developed uh, three, at least at least three to five projects that you have on your GitHub. If you have community work to show your soft skills and your people skills, then no need for the two plus years of experience. Unfortunately, in our, like, especially in the Middle East, they ask for this kind of experience because we don't work on our self development, like, and in, 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 on our, like, free time, if you want, on our time. 
So we need those two years in a company so we can learn inside the company about our experience and our soft skills. So like really, um, again, uh, I'm just giving one, one example. In my class, the people who listen to me who started going to the conferences, meeting people, doing community work, working on some project, although they weren't like people in the class, got really good opportunities. The people who thought I'm telling them and apologies here bullshit, actually they didn't find uh, opportunities after even six months or seven months of graduation. So uh, it's, it's always up to the personal attitude. Just think about how many people are graduating on yearly basis, how to be special, how to be unique, how I'm gonna convince the company that if they hire me and they pay $1,000, for example, at least I'm gonna like have a return on investment of $1,000 per month. They're not gonna hire me and lose money when hiring me. So how I can prove it to them that my skills could get them this amount of money at least for my salary per month. And then we would know how to work on our. What is the roadmap of a product manager and data analyst? The product manager is a data analyst. Data analysts, first, people should ask themselves if they like everything related to statistics, if they like handling all this amount of data, because you're going to aggregate all those data, then you need to clean up the data, then you need to aggregate them, then you need to use some algorithm to actually present those data in the way we. And then we need to ask ourselves, do I like to handle data in one specific industry? Like if I'm passionate, for example, about education, perhaps I invest my data uh, analytics in one actual industry and not the others. Uh, as for product management, it needs a certain seniority because we hear a lot here in the startup, product manager, two years of experience, or CTO, sometimes two years of experience. Never done a product management role when I had three or four years of experience. It means at least five months. So if the companies cannot afford to pay for a product, it's not about the titles. As well as professionals, we follow the titles a lot. When I joined Mirax, I joined even before registration Mirax. I had the title of environment and configuration manager. It was something huge. I was, but then I was doing like really operation work in the beginning. So let's not follow the title because really the good companies don't care at all about the title. They care about our skill set, our resiliency, about those skills that we mentioned. They don't care at all if we have like like I was the founder of and the CTO and the CEO of a company, but my startup was very small. Definitely, it's not the same if I say like I'm a CEO of a company that have hundreds of people working in it. So we need to be more humble and following like titles and focusing on how to reach their product. I need to understand what business owners want, what C-level people want, what my clients want. And this is the main point. I need to know the need of the market. I cannot start telling I want to be an entrepreneur. Let me start by doing this idea, let's draft a product. If I'm not basing myself on real data, on real need, then I might not succeed with my product. And I need to know what innovation means, how to be innovative. How do I call myself as an innovative person? What do I do in my normal days to make it better in an innovative way compared to my others? So we need to have people skills. We need to have people who can present because the product manager is not only technical. I need to deal with clients. I need to do interviewing with a lot of people to have my, my product ready. I need to know uh, at the end and pitch it for, for investors with like, uh, for example, the CEO and the C-level people in my company. I need to understand the financial aspect. I need to know how to work with the marketing team because I need to market my product. So I need all this kind of expertise that needs time to be able to build them uh, year after year. Educational technology industry, like everything related to learning is booming now. Uh, like, uh, for example, Moodle have been used by a lot of companies for like for attack related during this crisis. But then it's not only about using a tool, the curriculum itself and the content should be adapted to fit an online learning. Because if I'm working with a lot of formulas, for example, and I don't have a smart way into doing tests online and to actually letting my, 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 my students understand all of those formulas, if I'm not like writing them on the board, it's completely different. Uh, so we need first to enable all the teachers to know how to use technology and LMS. We need to teach them how to draft courses on LMS because 
courses I give physical on university is completely different from courses I give online. The strategy is completely different. So how to handle this? Of course, it's the future. But that being said, I don't believe in full uh, distance learning because it might be boring at a certain level. The best mode of learning is the hybrid mode. I do half of my like learning online, which is good for me because it will give me the flexibility of time. But as well, I can go on site, I can like, get to work with projects with my like colleagues, and then perhaps ask my teacher all the questions like face to face. So the hybrid mode is going to be the main mode moving forward. Because now, even if we're going to look at the statistics of online learning of courses, for example, you see only 10% reach actually the 100% of the course completely online because they might get bored. It's more interactivity. So not only like uh, free, if you want, uh, videotaped courses provided. It needs to be live, perhaps this would be like more attractive for people. So definitely it needs to be more thought of on how to sustain students into the actual full course when working on this. How can the government inside big companies to open offices in Lebanon? Uh, this is uh, like a good question. First, they shouldn't like uh, set a quota for big companies, indirect quota to open here, but this is something else. It's more related to the uh, But from like a practical side, in terms of implementation, free zones could help a lot. When we talk about free zones, it's providing incentive for companies uh, to open without paying tax at all. If someone gonna ask me now how not paying tax uh, could actually like help the economy because this company is coming here, it's not paying tax, but it's like employing thousands of people. When we say about companies opening in free zones, it's really huge company, not companies like who are gonna hire two or three people. We are talking about thousands of people getting hired. Those people are spending their money inside the community again inside the country so this will boost the whole ecosystem so in those free zones as well we can have like more like having 24 24 7 electricity having fiber optics internet because we don't have the budget to have this all around lebanon but concentrating like those services as sustainable services and free zones let's say three or five in the main districts in lebanon and not beirut the concept of free zone is mainly in distant areas or even in rural areas outside of Beirut, this will create equal opportunities even for everyone, not only the people who can afford to live in the city. I graduated as a mechanical engineer, but I didn't find opportunities. I have decided to start learning coding. What advice can you give me? Like if you started learning coding because you like it, then I need to upload you and tell you that you are on really good track because coding definitely is needed. But if you jump from one place to another because you didn't find your place in mechanical engineering, then this would, I would have encouraged you to even like try more and ask more and here where we need mentorship. Like if you go to Indefco, for example, you have a lot of electrical and mechanical engineers. Try to outreach 10 to 20 people on LinkedIn. One of them would answer. Like I used to send a lot of messages for people when I was like growing in my career ladder. Like I sent 10 messages, one would reply, but then it's fine. This is like the, this is the, the general average of people who would uh, reply to a LinkedIn message and ask them, I need just 15 minutes of your time to ask you some questions on how I could succeed in mechanical engineering. And here you need people specialized. Like I can mainly cover everything related to technology, but more from a software development side. I cannot be the expert now in mechanical engineering, for example, or in electrical engineering. I could tell you how it could be included in robotics, for example, but not as a standalone. So here we need as well to be humble and just to know who are the people we are asking for advice. Go to people senior in their domain, my domain as mechanical engineer, to ask them some questions. And mechanical engineering is beyond only companies who are now able like to do certain construction and having mechanical and electrical on top of them. It's much further than this. And we need to have our own research and development. What is the future, for example, of mechanical engineering? Now in the HR tech sector, you're gonna have plenty of opportunities related to mechanical engineering. You need to choose what I wanna work on, even for agri-tech, for agriculture, if you don't like to work, for example, in health tech sector for everything related to clean energy. You need to choose the industry you like 
and then go vertical. I cannot just like jump from one place to another without having a label expertise in something specific. Again, if you like coding, then it's great. Then you can add this experience of mechanical engineering on top of coding. It will give you uh, something great in, in, like, in return, but then you need to go vertical again. And here we need people to be industry uh, oriented. Like for example, it doesn't like need only to be a great uh, software developer. I'm usually develop a lot and everything related to learning management system. Why? Because it's going to be really quick for me to work on projects. I know all the libraries, for example. I know how to get all the components needed. So I need all those. We need more people in industrialized sector specifically. And this is what we don't have now. I'm talking globally, not only here. So do you want us to ask a few questions from... Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. So... I'm gonna start by uh, one of them. The first one is that for early, early students who attend universities that focus a lot more on the theoretical aspects of engineering, rather than building up the student to be able to work in the current market, what would you advise them to take advantage of of their current time, uh, especially in the pandemic, till the pandemic is over? Definitely to work on projects. Like I'm gonna give you the example of uh, like my, my husband now. He is in his late thirties. When he was like very young, uh, he wanted to learn coding, and he was at Lebanese University. So definitely the same way of theoretical way of learning everything. So and uh, he used to work to actually get enough money to go and buy CDs to learn how to code well. And he contributed to ASP.NET. So ASP.NET community by then was people putting their problems, like Stack Overflow now, people putting their problems. I go and I try to fix it for them as a volunteer. I'm not only doing this like to serve them. Definitely it's part of the community spirit. But he learned a lot along the way just by helping others. And then he got a certificate and he got uh, like a, a job offer from Microsoft after that, just because he had done this effort which he was doing it for free just for learning, but definitely it was a good ROI to get a job offer. So here my question is, first, you need to be part of communities. This is really important because you need people around you, like-minded people to tell you you have this option and that option. No webinar is enough to give you a full orientation on what you want. It's a daily operation and daily engagement in communities that's going to give you all the options you might have. I learned a lot, a lot from Facebook developer circle. I'm not only organizing events, I'm listening to all those amazing speakers coming. I'm listening to the stories of all the, from junior to senior people attending the community to hear about what they have to say. And I learned a lot from this. We need to acknowledge that we learn from each other a lot. So we need to go to the communities and we need to do free projects. You can go to Stack Overflow and try to do it. I didn't hear like Eddie that did he mention exactly his major. I tend to focus on software development in my in my examples, but if he has different features, he doesn't know. No, no, it was anonymous. So this is the, the question. This is all of it. it. It's really dependent on my major. Like there's some. It depends if what I'm doing. Like if I'm learning something, how I can contribute. Like for example, even if I studied law. I can try now to go and check what available law I can have. I can try to see how and then I can amend them. And why not try to go and then present them again? So for us, it's something that will never happen. And then let's not do this. This is how our mindset will grow. It will not lead us anywhere. But actually, it could lead us somewhere if we start uh, from what we're doing right now. Like, for example, my friend is a dietitian. She started on Instagram with zero followers, trying to give free uh, free advices for everyone about about food, about food safety, how they should cook, and all of that. And it is a point having tens of thousands of followers organically. I'm not talking about like paid people. And now she's working with many clients. Most of them are outside Lebanon with more ability to pay. And now she's getting paid like in return. Many other nutritionists have decided that it's a really bad time. I cannot do anything, and I'm depressed. She decided to to take a stand and to try to do something. And she did many mistakes along the way. I'm not talking that some people are extremely clever. There's no really lucky, clever people here. Just people trying over and over again to reach what they want. So I tried to give two examples for a little bit from technology. 
but to say it's only a matter of, of decision and it's fine if I don't know, but I need to search in the right place. And I need to reach the people who could help me search in the right place. Like if I don't know a nutrition, again, only and try to see who are people that seems really well established in this specific field. Try to send them messages to see who would respond. We have a lot of great communities uh, existing in Lebanon that we should take part of. PR is, is always very important for us to learn from each other. Okay, so. Sarah, one of the questions is the following. How far do you think COVID crisis has created opportunities for businesses to be more innovative? It has forced businesses to be innovative, definitely. But the problem is that such pandemic are forcing the companies. The company should consider with pandemic or not every day as an opportunity to innovate and to be ready whenever we have another type of crisis. So today we have a COVID-19 that not, none of us have thought about having a global lockdown for months for now. We can never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we need to be ready and we need to be proactive. I didn't do this. Again, I'm not trying here just to throw like uh, speeches on anyone. I didn't do this, but I learned from my mistake that I should always be ready. So that's why I took the whole experience of shutting down my company as positive one, because I learned the lesson of my life. So I took it positively and I want to work on this moving forward. So definitely COVID-19 has helped companies like experience what they anyway they're going to experience four years from now because everything is going digital, everything is going automation. So at least they have now a buffer uh, to work on this meanwhile. Okay, so all of them are able to cope anyway. We're seeing a lot of companies like closing down. Okay, so uh, one more, uh, another question is actually two parts. So how can how can a company that is used to time based effort change to a result oriented working environment system? How can it change to that? And the second part will post COVID. Be a, pro, uh, a byproduct to achieve this working uh, system, uh, working from home, or uh, still based on time spent working uh, as a mindset at home. How how would how would this evolve? Like working on the culture, it's double edged. So there's a responsibility of the employee to actually propose solutions, not go to the, like, to the HR or even to the management and say we have this and this problem. But then they need to see like those are improvement and not problem. And this is my proposition on how this could be done better. And here where I need your approval. So it's always good for employees. And here I cannot generalize again because unfortunately we don't have the best culture here in Lebanon. And this is one of the main points that's not letting us proceed as we want. I gave you the example of the young uh, like uh, developer who started the whole stories on Facebook. I don't think we have this kind of empowerment and and uh, and innovation in most of the like local companies we have here. So, but anyway, like before I I, I quit Mirex, for example, I have drafted a big plan on how the culture could be like done even like uh, could be improved at Mirex in terms of dealing with employees in terms of 360 degree feedback because. If you can, the only way to give feedback is to escalate or to say there's a problem to be fixed. Then, with the current culture, it could give us like and put us in a really like bad situation or unhealthy situation. Unfortunately, again, in our culture. So, if we implement this kind of feedback loop all the time, sustainable between the management and the employees, and everyone would feel heard and everyone would feel appreciated. And then, like the company needs to let the employees understand the whole. Uh, project, the whole vision of the company. Where am I, even as a junior, even as an intern, contributing actually to the whole objective of the company? Because generally here they give us as in, like as employees, they gave us like a certain amount of tasks and they tell us go and do them. We don't really understand the impact of what we do and which project always does it fall and what is the real impact of what we are doing. So engaging employees inside the project, they would feel they own the project. They don't feel like only I'm doing my job to get my salary and leave. No, I feel engaged. I feel ownership on the project and definitely I would do even better. So 
remote work, and here again, to be very honest, when the remote work used to be like once or twice per month, it was used to, to be considered by employees like as vacation. The level of productivity in those days were almost none. But now, since anyway, they have to work whole week from, from home, then they need to be productive, otherwise they will lose their jobs. Uh, so I think employees even learn how to be at home and be productive because this is kind of exercise and they didn't like practice it before. After COVID-19, even remote work, even if it's one day or two days per week, I think the healthiest point to say, again, it's the hybrid mode you were talking about, to have midweek working at the office and midweek at home. It will give the flexibility needed for employees to be happier. And at the same time, they learned already how to be productive even when doing home. Okay, so the last question will be this, and please, if you can give us a short uh, answer because we're running out of time. So uh, this is from a college students in, a student in Lebanon. I won't name the university. I'll just genera generalize the, uh, the question for everyone. So how is the outlook on jobs outside the country for foreign applicants, such as the US, Canada, Europe, Middle East, or the Gulf region, and others? How difficult will it be to apply for work outside uh, after graduation, uh, and especially after the pandemic? Applying for jobs directly after graduation is harder. Generally, the people go to a master's degree to get their master's. That will make it easier for them to find jobs. But here we have different kind of opportunities. If the question is leaving the country and going to work in Europe or in the US now, it's very hard with all the restrictions we have on the airport and all the regulations. But for remote work, there's no restriction at all. You can go on upward, you can go outside, even in the Gulf, you can go on Nabish, and you can create a profile. And then I can share definitely those sites of remote work as well with the organizers. You can create your profile and start by like by posting uh, proposals to actually get hired on project basis. Some projects are even for two years, for three years. So this is an opportunity now to work on companies, but those companies only work on skill sets. So if they find the right skills in this specific like profile, then they're gonna hire you. They don't care really about the country unless like there's a certain like uh, uh, special criteria, but in general, it's not a main problem uh, remote workers face. It's more if people gonna sponsor you to go as like as immigrants to actually go to as like sponsorship professor sponsorship is really it's becoming harder and that's why immigration out of lebanon is not becoming the easy option we always say we want to immigrate we're not happy it's not an ultimate easy option now and from from one part i'm not really like upset from this because then we're going to have less brain drain we're going to have our talent remain in the country and definitely with remote work, they can invest their talent in Lebanon, but also get paid from abroad and bring fresh money to Lebanon. So we don't need physically anymore to be present somewhere else. We can remain here and work for abroad and bring money to Lebanon. So uh, I really believe this has opened a huge opportunity here. Um, again, uh, I'm just giving the example of Lebanon to focus on it, but it applies as well to the whole MENA region. We can stay where we are, invest our talent here, and get paid from outside. Because we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn to learn with all other cultures. We're talking now uh, a lot as well about like all this racism worldwide. When we work with cultures, when we are exposed to the world, people, different nationalities, uh, different kind of backgrounds, different different ethnicities, then we will evolve as a human being. So this word with no boundaries throughout the digital arena is gonna give us a huge added value into like knowing how much we are alike. So even humanitarian level, it's gonna help us. Speeches, I really believe in this. And this is one of the main reasons I decided personally with my husband to stay here in Lebanon, although we get a lot of opportunities abroad. Uh, but we believe that we want to invest this here. That's why we, we uh, invest a lot in community work and volunteering work, uh, because we want to invest this energy here because our youth, our women, our professionals, our companies deserve it. So let's each of us do our role 
uh, to guarantee the best future for us all. With collective work, we can reach what we want, what we all want, without exception. Okay, so Sarah, I will really, uh, really thank you for your time. But there is one question that uh, just popped out right now, and I really want to take it. It's from Wissam. He he just asked it live. So uh, he actually has two questions, but we're gonna answer one uh, due to the to the time limit. Uh, do you think uh, for a working individual it is in, uh, essential to have a public content and account on social media? Um, I think if I want to choose between one social media, if I use it for my career, I would choose LinkedIn. LinkedIn generally is perceived by people as a platform in which I apply to jobs, but it's not actually for that. The main usage of LinkedIn is to meet people on a professional level, not on a personal level. So that's why I was telling you, try to find people and send them messages. It's not only for job application. Uh, like rarely people who just have really basic profile and apply for jobs, I can apply forever without having anyone contacting me. Mainly when I work on my LinkedIn profile a lot, I will reach a point where recruiters started contacting me on daily basis. If I am a person who don't like to share my personal info, or personal pictures, for example, on social media, then it's fine. It's my own decision. It's my right. But on LinkedIn, it's only professional. It's professional thought. It's perhaps if I was a speaker at a conference, I want to post it so I can get more opportunity to be a speaker in other conferences, for example. So if I would have to choose one of them, I would choose LinkedIn for a professional reason, even if I decided not to have Facebook or, or like or Insta or something else. But if my work is more community oriented, then Facebook here would help a lot in the outreach because Facebook reach everyone. On LinkedIn, for example, if I want to take the example of Lebanon, we only have less, around less, if I'm not mistaken, in the last stats I have of people on LinkedIn. So uh, it depends who I want to reach and why I want to reach them. Okay, guys, so we're at the end. Uh... First, I would like to thank you to thank you, Sarah, for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for all that you, we've talked about. Uh, there's a lot of comments that you are an inspiration. You are really amazing. So we read, we'll send these to you very soon. Uh, for those that are listening to us now, we'll be sharing what Sarah, uh, Sarah's uh, PowerPoint and presentation. And hopefully, if she has the time, she can answer some of the questions that weren't answered and we'll post them on our Facebook page for sure. Please join the Facebook page, you know it, uh, IEEE Young Professionals Lebanon. And thank you for your time, everyone. We hope to see you again next year or maybe in our other events. So see you. Everyone, and good luck. And thank you, Eddie and the team and Jad and for, for all the organization. Anytime, and it's our pleasure to host you and to have everyone with us. See you guys so much. It was a pleasure having you with us on this event. Thank you.